Today, we want to continue solving equations, and our technique for solving equations is to read the expression and then perform inverse operations in reverse order. So this is setting us up for looking at inverses of functions. And this is also reinforcing our ability to read what's going on in an expression. So let's remind ourselves of some important things. We know that addition and subtraction are inverses and that multiplication and division are inverses. Those ones are easy to keep track of. The other operation that we have is exponents. So the inverse of an exponent is a reciprocal exponent. Another notation that we have is radical notation. And we just wanna remember that radicals are fraction exponents. The index of the radical is the denominator of the exponent. The index of the radical is the denominator of the exponent. And equations with even numerators, exponents, will have two real solutions. So even numerator exponents, not the denominator. It's not the square roots and the fourth roots or one fourth powers in the equation. It's when we use those. So let's look at an example that has all of these things. It has a radical, has an even numbered exponent, and it, uh, we have to keep in mind the order that things are happening. The other thing we wanna remember with this two real solutions is that the two solutions show up when we undo an even exponent. That's when we split into two solutions. So two solutions happen when we undo the even exponent. So the two solutions happen when we undo the even exponent. Let's take a look at this equation. We have the cube root of the square of the sum of x and five is equal to seven. We want to read the expression and say what happens to this expression. The first thing that I want to notice is that there's a radical in my equation. And the index of the radical is the three. So I know the index of the radical is the denominator of the exponent. So I want to rewrite this, this, this expression as x plus five to the two thirds. Because now instead of seeing three things happening, I see two things happening. So the index of the radical is the denominator of the exponent. And this is still all just equal to seven. So now we want to read what's happening to turn an x into a seven. So to turn an x into a seven in this problem or this equation, the first thing that we do is we add five. And the second thing we do is we raise to the two thirds power. Since we've summarized this and so we separate, instead of having a separate radical and a square as two separate things, since they happen right next to each other, we can combine them into a two thirds exponent. So now when we go to solve, we're gonna perform inverse operations in reverse order to turn the seven back into the X to figure out what the X is. First, we'll do a reciprocal exponent and raise seven to the three halves power. And second, we will subtract five. So we're incorporating everything that we know about solving equations so far. We're gonna grab our calculating machine and we're gonna raise seven to the three halves power. And this is where the two solutions are gonna show up because we're undoing an even numerator exponent. So I need seven to the three halves power. So I'm gonna get seven to the three halves power and we'll get 18.520 and a negative 18.520. When the two solutions show up, when they first show up, they'll just be opposites of each other. So I have a negative, oops, a positive 18.520 and we'll have a negative 18.520. If 
but we undid an even numerator exponent. So two solutions show up. Now I've got to take the 18.520 and subtract five. And so one of our solutions is going to be 13.520. Then I am also going to take a negative 18.520 and subtract five. And so I'll have negative 23.520. So these columns here are what's happening in our mind as we read the equation. These steps here we're performing on our calculator. So I could take the 18.520 and add five. And then I can take, oh, I subtract five. So I can take the 18.520 and subtract five. And then I can take the 18.520 change the sign and add five. So I'm going to subtract five and make that, I did it backwards again. I'm glad I'm recording all these mistakes. This is what happens when I have to start class an hour earlier than normal. Let me try this again. So I'm going to take the 18.520 and subtract five to get the 13.520 and then take the 18.520 uh, a negative 18.520. See, I keep doing it. I knew eventually I'd be able to handle that. And then subtract five to get the negative 23.520. So that's taking place. This column is taking place on your calculator. What takes place on your paper is you just tell me the approximations to the nearest thousand. So you just tell me the answers are 13.520 and negative 23.520. And this incorporates all the things that we wanted to do when we read the expression. Now I combined the radical and the exponents because they take place right next to each other. So that raises an important question. When can I combine the radical and the exponent? When can we combine the radical and the exponent? When are the radical and the exponent going to be, uh, when can we put those two things together? In this case, we could, because if we read this expression, if we just read the expression, the cube root of parentheses x plus five close parentheses squared, if we read what's happening in the order of operations here, the first thing that happens to the x is we add five. The second thing is we raise to the second power and then the third thing is we do a cube root. The reason that we can combine the square and the cube roots into one exponent is that they take place in uh, right next to each other in the order. I have two exponents happening right after the other, one after the other, so this we can combine into a two thirds exponent because they're consecutive, not separated. So we have consecutive exponent operations. We can combine consecutive exponent operations and say that this is just x plus five to the two thirds power. The reason that we could do that is that we had consecutive exponent operations. If I had things in a different order, if the plus five happened in between the square and the cube roots, then we cannot. Math is a very precise written language. So here's one example. Let's look at another example. Let's suppose that we have the fifth root of x to the fourth minus three. I don't know if changing all the numbers helps or keeping the numbers 
So I, I decided to change them to see if this lands any differently. So let's look at the order of operations here. Let's read this expression. The first thing that happens is an x to the fourth. So I'll write first thing we do to the fourth power. Then the second thing that happens is a minus three. And then the third thing that happens is a fifth root. Here, the exponent operations are non-consecutive. The negative three is in between. So we cannot combine the exponent operations. So the exponent operations are not consecutive. So we can't combine. The exponent operations are not consecutive. So we can't combine. Negative three is breaking up the two uh, exponent operations. So the best we can do to rewrite this expression it, with an x with a, if we write it with a radical, I'm sorry, if we write it with an exponent is to say x to the fourth minus three to the one fifth power. When we write it with um, in these with in this form with the fraction exponent, we can see that exponents do not distribute over sums. So we remember our old rules, exponents do not distribute over sums. Well, I usually say the operation addition. So I'm not introducing some kind of new rule here. I'm not saying you can't combine the exponents when they're not consecutive for some arcane reasons. It's just because exponents do not distribute over addition. So it goes all the way back to the beginning when we're just learning how these operations work. Exponent operations are not consecutive. That means we can't write um, with one exponent because exponents do not distribute over addition. Note that this combining consecutive operations, um, we're just once again modifying stuff that we already know. If I have an expression, If I have an expression, the consecutive operation thing isn't new. Let's just put it that way. The consecutive operation thing isn't new. So I'm not giving you a new piece of information. I'm presenting an old piece of information in a new context. So for example, if I have an expression that says do 3x and then add 2 and then subtract 7, our instincts alone would be enough to say, oh, I got a plus 2 and a minus 7. Let's just combine those two to a minus 5. And we would write that as 3x minus 5. If we analyze it with the our order of operations reading like we like to do, I don't know if like to do is the right thing, but that I'm asking you to do. First, we multiply by 3. And second, we add two. And third, we subtract seven. We have consecutive addition operations, so we should combine them. So we can write that as 3x minus 5. It's just more of the simplification that we've seen before. So not a new thing, old thing, new way, or new context. We can always try to say, why should we bother learning things like this? because isn't there a standard way of doing things? Which is an argument 
against knowing something, which I will always oppose. Because we should always oppose someone says we should that says we shouldn't know something. With regards to math, anyway. It's not like this is a class on eldritch horrors where I'm like, oh, no, we shouldn't tell you about that. Because then you'll form a cult and summon Cthulhu and then, you know, the world is plunged into darkness and chaos. So math does not contain any forbidden knowledge. Knowing stuff is always better. Then of course the counter to the, the, the thing that comes up after that is people say, well, I don't need to know this to get by. And like the math that you needed to, that you needed to know to get by pretty much ends in fourth grade. I think that's when you learn decimals. And once you learn decimals, you're pretty much good to go. But if we're, you're done with all your math learnings, then, then, then what are you doing here? Go use your math learnings. So. I don't understand the argument against knowing something. Know what I mean? But actually, I, I understand it. I just think it's a bad idea. I know what you're on about. And I think you're wrong. When you're arguing against knowing something, especially something like math. So the consecutive operation thing isn't new. We just need to decide, need to be able to determine when we can do that thing. And so if I have a square and a cube roots happening consecutively, I can combine those exponent operations into a two thirds exponents. But if those exponents are separated by an addition, since exponents do not distribute over addition, we cannot. Any questions, comments, snide remarks? All right, here's the new thing. Our new toy when we're solving exponent solving equations is going to be negative exponents. We just barely introduced the concept of negative exponents last week. And I sum it up with uh, just writing down a few statements about negative exponents. So if I have an, a negative exponent, we've got to learn how to read it. So if I have x to the negative three, we can write this as one over x to the third. I have a negative exponent in the numerator, it's a positive exponent in the denominator. And the reverse of that, the inverse, not really an inverse, I guess the, just the reverse. If I have a negative exponent in the denominator, I have a positive exponent in the numerator. This is what negative exponents do. An important thing to realize is that the, the exponent only applies to the thing that's right next to it. So if I have an expression that says 2x to the negative 3, only the x gets the negative exponents. If I want the negative exponent to apply to both of the factors, I need to use parentheses because the order of operations says to do exponents and then do your multiplication. So do your exponents. That's what it looks like to raise something to the, negative, to the negative third. It's raising it to the third power in the denominator. And then multiply by two. This is what it looks like to multiply by two. You stick a two in the numerator. So if I want the two to be part of this exponent business, I need to use parentheses. So if I have four x all to the negative five, now everything gets a negative exponent. So this is going to be a 4x to the fifth, all in the denominator. 
This is just reading expressions. And this is how we read negative exponents. The other cool thing with negative exponents is that this is not something that's new. We're familiar with this because we study decimal numbers. The decimals require us to use negative exponents. We just usually aren't presented with them as negative exponents until we start talking about things like scientific notation. But if we have a thousand, that's a 10 to the third. If we have the hundreds place, that's a 10 squared. The tens place is a 10 to the first. The ones place is a 10 to the zero. And so we got three, two, one, zero. There's only one place to go after this. That's into the negatives. 10 to the negative one is the point one. 10 to the negative two is a point zero one. 10 to the negative three is a point zero zero one. It just keeps counting down. So thousands is 10 to the third, thousands is 10 to the third, hundreds is 10 squared, tens is 10 to the first, units is 10 to the zero, tenths is 10 to the negative one, because 10 to the negative one is one over 10 to the first. 10 to the negative two is one over 10 squared, which is one over 100. 10 to the negative three is one over 10 cubed, which is one over a thousand or thousandths. So the decimal system requires that we have these negative exponents. So we are familiar with them already. We just not, might not have been aware of our familiarity. Any questions? Comments? So what does this mean for equations? This is just a new thing that we can incorporate in solving equations. It's we're gonna see some variables that appear in denominators and we're just gonna read that as a negative exponent. So for example, let's suppose that I have an equation that says um, one divided by three X minus five is equal to Eight. I needed a number and I came up blank. Uncountable infinity of things to choose from. And I'm like, oh, I can't pick one. Sometimes we think we want more choices, but in reality, we want fewer choices. It's more satisfying when we have fewer choices. Let's read this expression to see what's happening to the X, to turn all this stuff into, the, into an eight. And we want to read it with exponents. I want to read this 3x minus 5 as 3x minus uh, the 1 over 3x minus 5. Since all this is in the denominator, I'm going to read that as a negative 1 exponent. So if I start with the x, the first thing what happens to the x is we multiply by 3. And next, we'll subtract 5. But then all this stuff gets pushed into the denominator. So the third thing that happens is we raise this to the negative one exponent. That's how we turn an x into an eight in this equation. So to undo those things, to turn an eight back into the x that we're looking for, first, we can raise it to the reciprocal of negative one, which is also a negative one. Second, we will add five, and third, we'll divide by three. So remember, reciprocals are things that multiply to get positive one. Negative one times negative one is positive one. The reciprocal of negative one is negative one. Negative one is self-reciprocal. Then we just grab our calculating machine and start doing these operations. I raise eight to the negative one power, which is the fraction one over eight, or I can just be like, all oh, eight to the negative one, and it'll be 0.125. 
And then I take the 0.125 and then we add five to it. And then I take the 5.125 and divide by three. And I want to answer rounded to the nearest thousandth. So I'll just say x equals 1.708. If we want the exact value and we're lucky because it's rational, we can try converting it to a fraction and it's 41 over 24. We didn't raise to some funky power. We raised to an integer power. So, or sorry. Um, we got a rational number when we raise it to the exponent. So here's our exact, or here's our approximation to the nearest thousandth. And then if we want the exact, we can actually just convert it to a fraction, which was 41 over 24. We use the calculator in this case to convert it to a fraction. What we could also do is view eight to the negative one as one over eight, and then add five, and we'll get five and one eighth. Five and one eighth is eight times five is 41 over eight. And then when we divide by three, if we take 41 over eight and divide by three, that's multiplying by one third, and that gives us 41 over 24. So if you're like, oh no, I'm stuck without my calculator. That's okay. Fractions are here to help. Any questions? I think this fraction might be business might be the topic for tomorrow. Dividing a fraction by three means multiplying the denominator by three. Oh, I just did tomorrow today. So speed run through algebra. Any questions? So what we're doing is we're viewing this 3x minus 5 as a negative exponent. We're looking at this as 3x minus 5 to the negative 1. Any questions? Let's do one more example with a negative exponent. The game now is just gonna be stacking up operations and practicing reading those operations so we can perform inverse operations in reverse order. Ooh, it's week nine already. So let's suppose that we have an equation that says, let's take four and divide that by the cube roots of x squared plus one equals seven. So, First thing that'll happen at this point in your algebra career when you see an equation like this is, you'll say, when am I ever gonna have to solve this equation? And the answer is, after now, never. Or actually after the quiz, never. Uh, after the final, never. After you get out of this, you're not gonna be encountering equations like this. Because equations like this are not, I didn't pick this equation because it's some equation that I keep running into in my daily life. Well, I do, but y'all won't. But because this one gets uh, to drive home a certain point. I want to read this cube root of x squared minus one as a negative exponent. So I have a cube root of the x squared plus one in the denominator. I want to read this with 
a negative exponent. I also want to maybe combine the exponents where I can, but more importantly, I want to read this with a negative exponent because I want addition, multiplication, and exponents. Those are the things that we know how to undo. So this cube root is a one third exponent in the denominator. So I want to read this expression as I get four, and instead of divided by the cube root, divided by this one third uh, x squared plus one to the one third power. First, we'll want to notice that I can't combine the two and the one third power because of the plus one. The plus one is in between the squaring and the one third power. I can't combine them. But I can write the, all this stuff with this negative, this one third exponent down here. I can write that as four times x squared plus one to the negative one third power. Notice that I'm not changing the x squared in here. It's the one third that's pushing this all into the, into the denominator. So I have blob to the one third, four over blob to the one third is four blob to the negative one third. Now we can read the expression all with exponents, multiplication, and addition. So let's read this expression. What, what happens to turn an x into a seven in this case? First, this all still equals seven because I'm just rewriting the expression so I can read it. The first thing that happens to the x is we square it. And then the second thing that happens is we plus one. Then third, we raise to the negative one third power. And fourth, we multiply by four. The squared and the plus because exponents go before addition. And then the negative one third because exponents go before multiplication. And so here's how we turn an x into a seven. We have now read the expression. Now I wanna do inverse operations in reverse order to turn a seven back into an x. So first we'll divide by four. Second, we'll do a reciprocal exponent raised to the negative third power. Third, we'll invert the plus one with a minus one and fourth, We'll inverse the square with a square root or a one half power. Here's an even numerator to exponent. So this is where we're going to get two solutions. But it happens right at the end, so we won't have to worry about it until the end. Now, this is all the stuff that's taking place in our mind. Even this stuff is taking place in our mind, ideally. If we have to write it down for now, then that's okay. That's how we learn. So we'll grab our calculator and do seven divided by four. And I'm gonna write down all the numbers in between because well, I guess technically I am recording my calculator, so that's fine. But seven divided by four is a 1.75. I'm just gonna stick with the, I'm just gonna stick with the decimals for now. Then I'm gonna take the 1.75 and raise it to the negative three power. That's going to give me a, um, a 0.187. And then I'll take the 0.187 and subtract 1. Negative 0.813. And finally, I'll take the negative 0.813 and raise that to the one half power. Oops, that's not what was supposed to happen. I was doing some other stuff earlier where I needed my calculator in complex mode. Gotta do the whole thing over again. So start with seven over four and then raise to negative three. and then subtract one. And then I'm gonna to raise to the one half power. And now let's make sure something weird happens. Uh, now we got non-real answers. So the calculator says 
non-real answer. So what this equation is requiring us to have is a negative 0.813 to the one half power. If we think about solving this equation, we're trying to solve x squared equals negative 0.813. So let's analyze. What happened was I put plus one when I intended to write minus one and then just ran with it and didn't notice until I was like all the way over here. I'm like, oh, uh oh, oh, oh dear, whoops. So what happened was we're trying to solve at this point in the equation, we're trying to solve x squared equals some negative number, specifically negative 0.813. But we can't, when we square a real number, x squared, we have copies of two copies of x and they'll have the same sign. But x squared has to be positive because the x has to have the same sign. Because x squared means x times x and the x's will have the same sign. There's two of them, and since they're copies, they'll have the same sign. So all we have to do to get around this huge problem is, oh darn, look at the time. I guess you know what we're gonna be talking about on Wednesday. All right, so next time we're gonna talk about what happens when we have something squared or an even exponent and we're trying to land on a negative number. All right, that's gonna do it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.